On April 13th, police announced an arrest had finally been made in one of the most infamous missing person cases of the last 30 years, one that started on a spring night in 1996. Kristen Smart was a 19-year-old student at California Polytechnic State University. Born in West Germany in 1977 to Stan and Denise Smart, both of whom were teachers, Kristen and her family moved to the United States when she was still a child purchasing a home in Stockton, California. From a young age, she showed an adventurous spirit and an incredible love for the ocean. She was also extremely fond of children, so much so that growing up, she was often the go-to babysitter for all of the parents in her neighborhood. In school, Kristen was a good student, but it wasn't always easy for her as she struggled with severe attention deficit disorder for which she was medicated. Despite this, she managed to finish high school with good grades and was accepted into California Polytechnic. Like many young adults, the confines of her native state was something she wanted to break free of, and Kristen's dream was to become a reporter, then leave the U.S. to travel the world. Tragically, this was a dream she would never get to realize. The night of May 24th, 1996 started like your average Friday evening for a 19-year-old college student. With her dorm mate gone for the night, Kristen wanted to find a party. Her and a friend who lived down the hall named Margarita Campos met up with a couple of other girls and decided to try their luck around campus. They flagged down a guy they knew who was driving by in his truck, and the group set out in search of a good time. Given it was Memorial Day weekend, a lot of students were out of town visiting their families, so their initial search wasn't very fruitful. They found out about a supposed party at a home near the college and made their way over to it, only to be disappointed when they found out it was just a bunch of guys sitting around playing video games and drinking beers. Which sounds like a blast to me personally, but I can understand that not scratching the itch for someone who wants something a little more lively. Kristen decided the party was a dud and headed back for campus with Margarita to try her luck again. Once they arrived, her friend had basically given up on the whole idea and was ready to head back to their dorm. Kristen, however, was determined. She'd had a tough first semester and had even confessed to her parents she was contemplating leaving the school at one point. Something not terribly uncommon for first-year students, as adjusting to life away from home can be difficult. She persevered, however, and had managed to finish the year with solid grades, something she was quite thrilled about. So it makes sense she would want to reward herself with a night of partying. Her and Miss Campos argued briefly, but eventually came to a stalemate. Margarita decided she was going to return to her room, and since there was still time to get back to the dorm before the doors were locked, she gave Kristen her key and told her she'd see her later. Unbeknownst to her, this is the last time she would ever see Kristen again. Shortly after splitting with Margarita, Kristen found a party that was being thrown at a local fraternity house for two of its members' birthdays. This party was much more exciting than the previous one, and as you would expect out of a frat house, there was plenty of alcohol. Now, accounts of this part of the evening have been a little mixed over the years. Some have stated that Kristen ended up getting very, very drunk, and caught the attention of other students at the party due to how wasted she was. Others have said they didn't really see her drinking at all, and then all of a sudden saw her extremely intoxicated toward the end of the party, leading to speculation she may have been slipped a date rape drug at some point during the evening. Regardless, I don't want to focus on this too much, because the way Kristen was acting at the party became a huge focal point in the media right after her disappearance, and I think that was pretty unfair. A 19-year-old getting super drunk at a college party is about as abnormal an occurrence as water being wet, and I think there's a lot of other aspects to this case that deserve more attention. 
Around 2 a.m., the party ended, and two other students named Cheryl Anderson and Tim Davis discovered Kristen passed out on the front lawn of a house next to the fraternity. They helped her to her feet and decided they were going to walk her back to her dormitory, given she wasn't in a state to get there herself. At some point during the walk, they were joined by a third student named Paul Flores, who also volunteered to help. The group continued on their way a bit before they each started going their separate ways. Tim left first as he lived off campus and needed to drive home, shortly followed by Cheryl, whose dorm was in the other direction from Miss Smart's. Before departing, Cheryl asked Paul to walk Kristen the rest of the way home, as his dorm was the closest to hers. Now alone with Kristen, Paul claimed he walked with her until they made it to his dormitory, which was just around the corner, and that she walked the rest of the way home by herself. This would be the last time anyone saw Kristen Smart. The next morning, Margarita knocked on Miss Smart's door around noon, but received no response. Assuming her friend was just nursing a hangover, she didn't think much of it and went about her day. Later that afternoon, Kristen's doormate returned home and found their room in an eerie state. All of Kristen's belongings were still laid out on her bed as they had been the day before, and Kristen was nowhere to be found. She didn't want to assume the worst, but as the day turned into night, she became concerned. She asked the other girls around the hall, including Margarita, if they'd seen Kristen recently, which none of them had. Once Sunday morning rolled around and Miss Smart still hadn't come back, the girls decided it was time to call campus police. University police spoke with Kristen's roommate, but decided there wasn't much cause for concern and declined to take a report. Despite her friends insisting otherwise, they believed Miss Smart had just run off for the weekend without telling anyone, which was a relatively common occurrence among students her age. This resulted in the actual investigation not officially beginning until Tuesday, after she'd been missing for more than three days. This incredibly slow response by campus police would draw a lot of criticism in the years following Kristen's disappearance, and would even cause a new law to be enacted by the state of California. But more on that in a bit. After speaking with her family and determining she hadn't contacted them since the previous week, they started to retrace her steps. They interviewed several people who attended the party, as well as the three people who'd walked Kristen home afterward, including Paul Flores. Mr. Flores was insistent that him and Kristen had parted ways when he reached his dorm, and that he had no idea as to her current whereabouts. Suspiciously, Officers observed Paul seemed to have a black eye during his initial interview, which he claimed was from a game of basketball. Furthermore, the more they asked around about Paul Flores, the more troubling information they found out. Paul had developed a reputation around campus for being very creepy and making unwanted advances towards female students, earning him the unflattering nickname of Chester the Molester around campus. This included several stories of him making unwanted sexual advances, touching women inappropriately, and even an incident where he climbed up onto a student's balcony and was caught spying on her through a window. In fact, Cheryl Anderson, who'd walked with Kristen and Paul the night of Kristen's disappearance, told police Mr. Flores was acting very creepy at the party and during their walk home together. She claimed he'd followed one of her friends around at the birthday party that night and cornered her in a hallway to try and kiss her. He was also apparently spotted acting in a similar manner with Kristen, particularly after she had become extremely intoxicated. When the three of them were alone and walking back to their dorms, Miss Anderson said she observed Paul getting very handsy with the barely conscious Kristen. And when Cheryl broke off from them to go back to her dorm, Paul started making advances towards her and asking for a hug and a kiss goodnight, even trying to pull her in for a hug and kiss after she had said no. 
A lot of criticism has been hurled at Miss Anderson in the years since for leaving Kristen with someone who is exhibiting such uncomfortable behavior. Even Cheryl herself admits that the decision to leave Kristen with Paul and return home still haunts her to this day. Between the signs he'd been in a physical confrontation and the reports of his behavior with his female classmates, police were immediately suspicious of Paul's story. But at this point, the priority was to find Kristen. And they were still holding out hope she'd run off with a friend and would return any day now. By the time June came, it was clear this was not the case. The San Luis Obispo Police Department was now involved and a massive manhunt was underway to find Kristen or her remains. Hundreds of civilian volunteers and police combed the area around California Polytechnic's campus with radar and police dogs, hoping to find some trace of Kristen. They were unfortunately unsuccessful. Police searched Miss Smart's room, which didn't turn up anything of relevance, and then searched Paul's room a short time later. By this point, he'd moved out and would end up dropping out of college before the next semester began. But cadaver dogs did pick up something which indicated a dead body may have been in the dorm at some point. Mr. Flores was brought back in for questioning and admitted he'd lied about getting the black eye from a basketball game, saying that he'd instead received it when he hit his head against the steering wheel of his truck while installing a new radio. Investigators did not believe him and pressed for more information, but Paul clammed up and stopped answering their questions, a pattern that would repeat itself over the coming years. In July, the Flores home was searched with ground radar and cadaver dogs, which didn't yield any new evidence. By this point, the Flores family was becoming very combative with investigators. Paul was no longer speaking with police anymore, and his father Reuben hired a lawyer who threatened legal action. Kristen's parents hired their own lawyer and filed a wrongful death suit against the university and Mr. Flores in November of 1996, beginning a very bitter saga of legal battles between the two families that went on for two decades. Throughout the rest of the year, several searches were conducted that again yielded no new evidence. The case stayed a hot topic in the media for the rest of 1996, but on Christmas Day, a six-year-old girl named John Bonet Ramsey was kidnapped and murdered inside of her Boulder, Colorado home, a case that garnered an absolute storm of media coverage and became arguably the most famous murder investigation in U.S. history. This unfortunately pushed Kristen's story to the back of the newspapers, and eventually out of the spotlight altogether. One group that was certainly not letting this case go was Kristen's parents, who pursued every lead they could with an unshakable determination. They fought tooth and nail to make sure the public wouldn't forget their daughter, whose body to this day has not been recovered. They paid for a billboard to be erected in Arroyo Grande with Kristen's face offering a $75,000 reward for any information leading to her whereabouts. They also continuously pressured police to not let up on the investigation, despite the lack of evidence that was turning up. In 1998, the California State Legislature passed a law written by Senator Mike Thompson called the Kristen Smart Campus Safety Act, which required all colleges to immediately report missing persons and other cases involving violence against students to local authorities. It passed the legislature by a vote of 61 to 0 and was signed into law by then Governor Pete Wilson. Over the next couple of years, Hundreds of leads were investigated, but one by one didn't produce any new evidence. In 2002, Kristen was officially declared legally dead on the sixth anniversary of her disappearance, and for a lot of cases, this would be the end. However, Kristen's parents were not to be deterred, and frankly demonstrated a level of willpower that is nothing short of remarkable. 
They continued to campaign publicly and filed several more lawsuits against Paul Flores, which resulted in more searches of the residents, as well as a countersuit by the Floreses against them for harassment. The San Luis Obispo Sheriff's Office seemed equally determined as well. Despite over two decades having passed since her disappearance, the case was never officially declared cold and they continued to pursue leads and sift through the evidence available to them. Finally, in September of 2016, after years of no new leads, FBI cadaver dogs alerted police to three dig sites around Cal Poly's campus. These sites were excavated, and investigators found several items of interest that are still being examined as of the recording of this video. In 2019, American musician Chris Lambert started a podcast covering the case called Your Own Backyard. It became an immediate smash hit and renewed public interest in Kristen's story almost overnight. I'll leave a link to it in the description, and if you find this case interesting, I honestly cannot recommend it enough. The level of detail and research Mr. Lambert put into this is remarkable, and with eight episodes each spanning an hour long on average, he's able to examine things in a much more thorough way than I could ever hope to accomplish in a 20-something minute YouTube video. As a result of the podcast's success, several new witnesses came forward offering previously unknown testimony to police. This testimony resulted in new search warrants being issued, and in February of 2021, investigators went to the home of Paul Flores, now 43 years old, and recovered several new pieces of evidence which have not been disclosed to the public at this time. In March, a search was conducted on the home of Ruben Flores, now 80 years old which allegedly uncovered physical evidence showing Kristen's body was buried on the residence at some point. On April 13th, Paul and his father Reuben were both arrested, and Paul was officially charged with murder in the death of Kristen Smart. The prosecution states they believe that Paul tried to sexually assault Miss Smart at some point as they were walking back to her dorm, and that when she fought back, Mr. Flores killed her. Reuben was charged with being an accessory after the fact, with the prosecution alleging that he helped Paul dispose of Kristen's body and continuously lied to police over the years in an attempt to protect his son. As of the recording of this video, Paul is being held without bail in a California prison. His father was later released on a $50,000 bond, with the judge citing his age and poor health as the reasons to release him. Kristen's family is approaching this new development with a cautious optimism, having grown all too used to disappointment over the years. They continue trying to keep her memory alive, setting up a scholarship in her name as well as a website, kristensmart.org, where people can go to learn more about the wonderful daughter that was taken from them all too soon. This is undeniably the most progress that's been made since Kristen first disappeared on that spring night in 1996. But as is always the case when we cover any ongoing investigation, I want to caution people from jumping to conclusions before the court process has played out. Every person, regardless of how damning the evidence against them may look, deserves their day in court, and innocent until proven guilty is a very important pillar of the American justice system. All we can do now is sit back, wait, and hope that 25 years later justice can finally be given to Kristen Smart. If you are interested in true crime, criminal justice history, or mysterious stories from around the world, consider hitting that subscribe button below so you can be updated whenever we post something new. We will be sure to give an update on this case as soon as relevant information becomes available, which you will find in the pinned comment below. This is Crime Spot, and thank you for watching. Boom, boom, boom.